Hello and welcome to World Bank Live. I'm Paul Blake at the World Bank Group headquarters here in Washington, D.C. Now, by just about any measure, the year 2022 has been an extraordinary one for the energy sector. Crude oil prices, for one, they're up over 15 percent since the start of the year, off of June's highs, but still elevated. Over in Europe, natural gas prices have been exceptionally volatile. In recent days, they've been trading at prices about eight times what we would typically expect them to be trading at. All of this is being driven by Russia's war in Ukraine, as well as the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's driving historical inflation that's leading to cost of living crises and extraordinary uncertainty. So what lessons can we take from previous energy shocks? What's next for energy markets? And what can be done to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels? Over the next few minutes, we'll be trying to answer these questions and more with a diverse global panel of experts, including from here in the United States at the University of Notre Dame, prominent academic Christian Baumeister, from the International Energy Agency, Chief Energy Economist Tim Gold, from Trinidad and Tobago, Minister of Finance Colm Imbert, and from JP Morgan, Head of Global Commodity Strategy Natasha Kaneva. Moderating today's discussion is Mari Pengestu, the Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnerships here at the World Bank. And myself and my colleagues will be joining all of you guys watching online to answer your questions on the live blog at live.worldbank.org as well as on LinkedIn. So please get your questions in over the next few minutes. We'll do our best to answer them. Mari, over to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, discussion on uh, energy uh, markets, their prospects, uh, and how uh, we should be responding uh, and uh, accelerating, hopefully, the transition toward low carbon uh, energy uh, sources. I'm Marie Pangestu, uh, Managing Director uh, at the World Bank. Uh, and let me just make a few uh, opening remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, why is this topic important and why is this an important topic for policymakers? Uh, the war in Ukraine, as we know, has disrupted global energy, fertilizer, and food markets, which had already been uh, in you know, uh, rising prices and so on prior to the war, but the war has uh, accentuated uh, these trends. Uh, and in the short term, higher energy prices and concerns about energy security, security threaten to disrupt or delay the transition to cleaner forms of energy, as several countries have announced plans to increase the use of coal to meet pressing energy needs. But we hope that in the longer term, that concerns about energy security will perhaps, uh, hopefully, hasten the transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy and battery powered transport, because we really need to get back on track on the decarbonization uh, objective. In particular, renewable electricity generation and battery powered transport are considerably more metals intensive than fossil fuel based electricity generation and combustion engine based transport. Uh, and this shift in global commodity demand may in fact cause large income shifts from fossil fuel exporting countries to metal exporting countries. And we really need to ensure that there will be a smooth adjustment uh, and this will require deft policy decisions. For instance, metals exporting countries will need to, uh, to manage uh, the business cycle swings uh, with the metal prices, including physical, uh, including fiscal rules, uh, sovereign wealth funds, and robust macroprudential uh, supervision. At the World Bank Group, we are exploring these issues, including in the recently published June 2022, World Bank Global Economic Prospects. The report includes a chapter uh, which is titled Russia's Invasion of Ukraine, Implications for Energy Markets and activity. Uh, I just want to highlight the three uh, key uh, takeaways uh, to uh, frame our discussion today. The first key takeaway uh, is that oil price movements driven by supply shocks in oil markets, such as the recent supply disruptions in global energy markets, are often associated with significant changes in global output and income shifts between oil exporters and importers. Second uh, takeaway is that compared to what happened in the 1970s, the recent shock has led to a surge in prices across a broader set of energy related commodities. Uh, so compared to the 1970s, this means that there's limited opportunity for substitution. Uh, and uh, the other uh, uh, metric here is also that 
the energy intensity of GDP is now much lower than it was in the 70s. So that uh, the demand re reduction uh, is, uh, uh, is not uh, an, uh, uh, a factor that uh, was the case in the 70s. And we may see consumers being less sensitive to relative uh, price uh, changes. A third uh, key takeaway is that policy responses have in fact tended to focus on increases in fuel subsidies and reduction in taxes to mitigate the effects uh, on consumer prices. Uh, and we know that uh, there's a lot of political considerations uh, behind these decisions, uh, rather than on what uh, uh, should happen, which is measures to address the underlying supply and demand uh, imbalances, like promoting uh, energy efficiency. Uh, so while energy su uh, subsidies may be unavoidable at present, governments should nonetheless put in place mechanisms that will um, uh, phase out these subsidies, especially once fuel prices uh, moderate uh, and their impact on vulnerable populations begin uh, to abate. Um, and foster energy transition by incentivizing both energy efficiency and a shift uh, in demand towards non-fossil fuel sources. Uh, and this can be uh, combined with regulatory efforts to encourage energy efficiency and the development of renewable energy sources. And I do think that developing countries, given the uh, fiscal constraints space, will have limited space, if you like, to um, uh, uh, enforce fuel subsidies, to continue fuel subsidies to uh, reduce the price to consumers. Uh, just to give you a recent example, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia and Malaysia uh, uh, started to uh, reduce their energy uh, subsidies. Uh, and of course, combined it with the uh, compensation uh, policies uh, to address uh, the impact for the vulnerable households, targeted social protection uh, schemes. So uh, to discuss these issues today, I'm delighted to be joined by our distinguished panelists, Christian uh, Baumeister, Baumeister from uh, Notre Dame University, Tim Gold from uh, the International Energy Association, uh, Minister Colm Imbert uh, from uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and Natasha Keneva from uh, JP Morgan. Uh, and with this, let's get started uh, with uh, our discussion. I'm gonna ask uh, uh, the same question to all of you. Uh, let's start with uh, what's, the, what's our outlook for the next 10 months? If you could get out your crystal ball, uh, what should we expect over the next 12 months and over the medium term? And where do you see the oil markets uh, heading? If I can start with you, uh, Natasha, uh, Mary, thank you so much for your question. Um, so the outlook from JP Morgan for the next 12 months is that we do believe that the prices will remain elevated. So to, to be precise, the price forecast calls for Brent international oil prices to average about $98 in 2023. Uh, I would have to say that the risk bias is for the prices to be about 5 to $10 lower than our, uh, than our uh, average price forecast, baseline price forecast. Uh, four drivers needed behind that. A global economy does not slip into recession. Oil demand resilient remains resilient considering the 30% drop in the price. And the gas to oil switching considering the record level of gas prices globally. Uh, the oil market should move into surplus next year because of that we see lower average prices and the e EU embargo on Russian crude comes into full effect in November. So $98, um, so the risk somewhere to be between 80, 88 and 93. Uh, more medium term, uh, the, 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 the outlook is that uh, the global oil prices will remain elevated and above the average is what we observed in uh, between 2014 and 2019. You remember prices were averaging about $60 at that time. So we believe that the prices over the next uh, decade will stay within you know, this $80, $90 uh, average bent on averages. Uh, the main reason for that is our outlook on demand. Uh, so we do not see oil demand peaking before 2030. That's the cutoff uh, date of our uh, forecast. We don't look beyond that. And if we, if we round in terms of our numbers and we say, okay, oil demand right now, it's about 100 million barrels per day. We believe by 2030, it will be 107.5, 107.3, somewhere there. So we have a very bullish outlook on demand, mostly because we believe that um, energy transitioning is a function of existing technologies. 
And at the moment, the only scalable uh, technology that we have that is accepted by both producers and consumers is electrification of the vehicles. So we believe gasoline demand will go down, but in all other um, sectors where oil demand is, uh, where oil is being consumed, uh, we believe that at the moment, we just, we don't have those scalable uh, technologies to make any difference between now and 2030. So we have oil demand growing. Uh, we need supply to match demand, and for that, we believe that significantly higher prices than previously, you know, the 60 long-term price, $60 long-term price, we, we, we see that we needed at least $80 to get the supply to, um, to match the demand. Um, so I will finish on that. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, good uh, overview of, of uh, what's going to happen um, and your forecast. Let me now turn to uh, Tim, Tim Gould. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mary. And uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to join you all for this, uh, this discussion. I mean, we have a slightly less bullish outlook uh, for oil um, over the medium term and towards the end of the decade. Uh, we see a slightly greater role for electrification of mobility, which takes the edge off um, of, of that uh, demand growth. Um, and of course, if governments do what they say they would like to do and uh, really stick to those climate pledges that they've announced in, in Glasgow and, and elsewhere, um, that would imply, in our view, that we would see a peak in oil demand um, by around uh, the middle of that, this decade. Uh, but if we um, look closer to the nearer term, there are some sort of competing narratives, if you will, um, around what happens in, in oil markets. And one of them, uh, as was mentioned by Natasha, is, is uncertainties over the economy. What is the impact of these high prices on economic growth? And I think, you know, the World Bank's done some really interesting work on that. I mean, since the beginning of this year, we've lowered our oil demand forecast for 2022 and 2023 by around uh, 1.3 uh, million um, barrels a day. And as we are all aware, um, the crude oil is now, you know, some $35 a barrel below its um, June peak. Um, China, both in oil markets and very importantly in gas markets, lower demand in China um, because of COVID restrictions and lower economic growth has really helped ease market conditions. Um, but there are a few elements to watch out for in the coming months. Um, thus far, we haven't seen dramatic declines in Russian production and export, but Towards the end of this year, when the EU embargo on Russian oil imports kicks in and also the ban on maritime uh, services, um, it's for crude in, at the end of, in, in December and then for products in, in February, that is likely to have a significant um, impact in our view. There's some uncertainty over how exactly that will play out, but that could tighten markets under some circumstances. And we need to make a distinction also between crude on the one hand uh, where market conditions have eased a bit, but diesel, particularly amongst the oil products, much tighter, um, and there is rather limited potential to increase refined rep product supplies in the short term. And um, so, uh, particularly again, once these restrictions on 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 Russian diesel exports come into play, um, that could be something to watch for the for the first half uh, of next year. Um, one one word additionally, because. I mean, as you mentioned, this is not a so much an oil crisis as a, as a natural gas crisis, and it will be a difficult winter in Europe. And Europe's additional demand for LNG because of the Russian pipeline cuts um, has had repercussions around the world, um, and nowhere, nowhere more so than, than in Asia. So I think we'll probably come back to that. But Asian LNG demand has been has been cut by high sort of mild winter temperatures, but also by these extraordinarily high uh, gas prices that we've seen. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, additional nuances on the forecast. Let me now turn to Minister uh, Imbert uh, for your Hi, good afternoon. Uh, well, if I believed the predictions, I would go and buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny, I have a meeting with our central bank every week, and one of the assignments I gave the professionals at the central bank was to look at the US Energy Information Administration's forecast for oil prices over the last seven years and see if they were right in any given year. I think they only came close in two. 
2017 was one of them, I think. And the other five, they were way off, you know, 40 to 30% wrong. So that I don't think it's an easy um, question at all. Uh, I do think, however, if you look at the issues with supply, if you look at issues with production, if you look at issues with demand, in 2019, the world oil production was 95 million barrels a day. And you had the three, the big three, Russia, United States, Saudi Arabia, each producing somewhere around 10, you know, 10 million barrels, sorry, 95 million barrels, 10 million barrels a day. And when you look at it, it's more or less maintained that profile with each of those big three players producing about 10 million barrels of oil per day. The United States has had a dramatic uh, increase in oil production over the last several years and has become the largest producer of oil. Russia has maintained sort of a constant 10 million barrels a day. I personally am projecting an oil price of somewhere in the vicinity of $95 for 2023. I suspect prices will remain elevated in that region for the next two or three years. There are issues with the Chinese economy with their continuing COVID restrictions causing lockdowns, uh, creating um, uncertainty in the markets and therefore affecting oil price. Oil price is so volatile. It's affected by anything. The US dollar goes up, oil price goes down. China doesn't register the kind of growth that people expect, oil price goes down. And of course you have war. So I think we're going to see periods of conflict going forward over the next two to three years. The, the production side has been affected by COVID. I can tell you, speaking from Trinidad and Tobago, our production in the gas sector was affected by lockdowns in Mexico where BP was constructing platforms to, to install in Trinidad to expand our production. And Mexico locked down for about six months. And therefore, we were unable to get those platforms and unable to continue to produce at the levels that we wanted. I believe this is across the board, across the world. I think production has been profoundly affected by COVID. And of course, you have the issue, the unforeseen events such as the war in Ukraine and so on. So that I am predicting $95 for 2023 and somewhere in the 90 to 90, 90 to 95 dollar range for the next three years. And that's based on my belief that the Chinese economy will rebound. They will sort out their COVID problems. The demand will improve. Right now we're, we're at about 80 million um, barrels a day, down from 95. I think it will get back up into you know, the, the, the 90 million barrels a day range. And I, the fundamentals are there for the price to remain in the 90 to 95 dollar range. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, over to you, Christian. Thank you. Well, delighted to be here uh, in this exciting uh, panel discussion round. Uh, so, well, as has already been mentioned, uh, there are plenty of challenges and uncertainties, both on the demand and uh, uh, the supply side of oil markets uh, right now. And uh, um, while currently I see demand uh, side factors uh, weighing on oil prices, so it has already been mentioned, the recurring lockdowns in, uh, in China are putting downward pressure on oil prices due to the weaker demand. Um, as well as the growing fears of recession in, uh, in advanced economies due to uh, the aggressive uh, monetary tightening to, to fight inflation, uh, which may also um, entail some uh, demand destruction. However, there are also um, kind of like, uh, there is a sign that these factors, or at least in my assessment, are of a more temporary nature. So uh, even if you look to China, oil imports in August uh, um, were still higher than they were in July. Um, Natasha, I think, mentioned uh, the possibility of fuel switching from natural gas uh, to oil for power generation, which could boost oil demand. Uh, another thing that has not been mentioned is the um, uh, considerable drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve over the past couple of months, um, uh, the, the releases of which will end uh, in, in October. Uh, they're currently already at a historic low, and at some point they need to be uh, replenished. So that should create some uh, additional demand uh, down the road. 
Um, but actually, um, my main concern is with the, the supply side, where I think down the road, um, the bottleneck is, is going to be. And um, uh, well, we observed already over the last uh, uh, couple of months, ever since OPEC Plus decided to reverse basically the cuts that they implemented uh, at the onset of COVID, that they failed to meet their production targets. So they always uh, under uh, produced as a group, which in my mind is a signal uh, that they are facing serious supply constraints that will be with us um, for the uh, near to medium uh, term. Um, in the most recent OPEC meeting, um, they announced a, a cut of about 100,000 uh, barrels uh, per day for October. And while this is a tiny fraction, I mean, I think it signals their intention uh, to support higher prices. We also saw that the U.S. shale industry is not willing this time uh, to uh, basically uh, chase higher oil prices. So they have shown remarkable discipline uh, and prioritized profits over drilling. So uh, I think we cannot expect them um, to basically make up for, for any gap. But then for me, uh, the real elephant in the room are the looming EU uh, sanctions in combination with the possibility of a price cap on Russian oil as Tim alluded to already. So mm -hmm. I think there's a huge risk that this um, could uh, uh, wreak havoc in, in global oil markets. And so uh, overall, I expect to see uh, rather a tightening of fundamentals uh, uh, down the road that will actually push oil prices back over $100 per barrel, uh, maybe even 110 and keep them there for a while. Thank you. So uh, I think the conclusion is that uh, energy prices uh, and other related prices will be continue to be elevated. Continued uncertainties on the supply side as well as on the demand side, uh, including uh, you know, what will happen with uh, the, the sanctions and so on. And I think uh, 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 Natasha raised an important point about the role of technology uh, as to whether this is going to affect any of the, either on the production side or on the, on the substitution side. So I think uh, we've had a, a good uh, 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 viewpoint from the crystal ball, but uh, certainly with a lot of uncertainties. And this is going to of course, be a continued uh, discussion. Let me now turn uh, to the next uh, set of questions, which is uh, really um, about how, what do we learn from past energy shocks? Because this is not the first time that we've had a, an energy shock, uh, uh, but the run-up in oil prices over the two, past two years has been large. In fact, uh, the largest since the 1970s, as our recent World Bank study has shown. In 1974, oil prices quadrupled and then doubled uh, in uh, 1975. Uh, at the same time, economies failed, uh, faced oil rationing and widespread uh, economic uh, uh, disruptions. So what lessons can we draw and what's the difference between the 1970s uh, and today's situation? Let me uh, start with you, Christian. Uh, based on your research and experience, what have been the lessons learned from the 1970s? Well, as you just pointed out, um, the uh, oil price spikes in the 1970s were uh, massive, and they actually set in motion a process of uh, fuel substitution, in particular for electricity generation, which moved away from oil to coal and nuclear at the time. Now, industries already at that time also uh, developed more energy efficient technologies and improved their energy conservation. And these efforts were supported by government policies aimed at reducing uh, oil usage and increasing overall energy awareness. And so as a result, the composition of oil demand ch changed quite considerably with consumption being concentrated more in petrochemicals and mainly in, uh, in the transportation sector. And also there, there was a move to um, more fuel efficient vehicles in, in part thanks also to the introduction of the cafe standards. Now this time around things are slightly different because the surge in energy prices is not limited to oil. So we have this broad based uh, um, surge in energy prices uh, also affecting uh, coal and natural gas in, uh, in particular. So right now there's less um, possibility for substitution to other fossil fuels, but of course renewables uh, are a, uh, an obvious alternative source of energy. And so I think one lesson, one takeaway from the 1970s is that um, government should pursue policies that encourage firm, firms and consumers to shift 
uh, to low carbon technologies and invest in renewables. And um, some provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act are, I think, a first step uh, in this direction, which I think is the right direction, um, but more needs to be done. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, Natasha, what lessons are financial market pa participants drawing from the 1970s? Uh, thank you. So to Christian mentioned the CAFE standards, but also what we need to remember is that uh, other lasting impacts of, uh, of the 1970s was the creation of the IEA, it's the Department of Energy and the creation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Yes, and I absolutely would like to point out as, you know, as a strategist who covers the oil, uh, the oil market is that the policy response from from the U.S. and the other IE members, uh, member countries, should not go unnoticed. So, the team, thank you so much for all your work this year. So, in terms of the financial markets, um, the 1970s markets they turned. Uh, so, what we observed, like on the physical side of the markets, is that in the 1970s, because of this massive spike in the price, uh, the markets turned to long-term uh, fixed price contracts, meaning that you're trying to fix the price for the next 10 years, and because of that, you have some some visibility about the or around volatility of your prices that goes into your cost inputs and also they build large conglomerates to deepen the balance sheet during those during those times uh, unfortunately this time around the, those two options were not not available to the market number one what we're observing and that's pretty much since 2018 probably that's where we noticed the biggest move taking place is that the market is moving away from the long-term contracts in energy to shorter and shorter contracts. So for example, if previously utilities were locking coal for five, seven years contracts, they were locking the price for that. So now we see the longest contract we can observe at the moment, it's about three years long. Mm. Very similar, especially in the European, European Union with the natural gas prices, if previously the length of the contract was between anyway, between 10, uh, 10 to 25 years. Now those contracts are becoming shorter and shorter. And the, you know, the, the, the most we're observing it's about five years long. So because of that, the volatility in the market is increasing. Uh, the balance sheet depths, especially from the from the financial uh, companies like JP Morgan, it's 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 definitely not there after the global financial crisis, and because of that, you, we were observing this year uh, a, a very very substantial liquidity drain from the markets, where we saw that liquidity in the commodities trading uh, was at some point was uh, down thirty percent. And so that's, you know, that's what is creating the volatility in the markets. And you can see that uh, at some point in May, oil price volatility was almost 80%. Uh, so it's, that's all those conditions are visible in the market at the moment. Uh, thank you. And that gives a good segue to, to Tim. Uh, Natasha mentioned that IEA was created after the 1970s oil price shock. Uh, and uh, in your view today, how do, how do the recent volatility in the energy markets and the world's ability to cope with them compare with those in the 1970s? Well, thanks, Marie, and thanks also to Natasha for her, for her answer and, and some great points from um, Christiane already. So I won't repeat those. I think um, we obviously remember the 1970s as a period of, of sort of dislocation, the pain of high prices, the economic implications, inflation, and so on. And, but I think we also need to remember that it was a period of quite strong energy innovation. And you see that in the deployment of, of nuclear in, in, in many countries, it's been mentioned. And there were incentives for efficiency. And if you just think about the United States, at the beginning of the 1970s, the fuel efficiency of an average new car sold in the United States uh, was 18 liters for every 100 kilometers. Um, by the end of the decade, it was closer to 10. I mean, manufacturers responded, consumers responded. Um, and so I think we can, we have grounds to hope that even amid the pain that's caused by today's crisis, that there may be some similar um, um, jumps ahead in terms of our, our, our ability to, and our willingness to, to deploy different technologies to meet our energy needs in future. Um, and the advantage that we have today is that we have a much broader spectrum of readily available, competitive, clean energy technologies to choose from. I mean, solar, wind, I mean, to a, to a large degree, also now batteries. These are technologies that are, in a sense, ready for the big time. I mean, we have obviously supply chain issues, but they are mature technologies. Um, 
And I think there's a willingness, and that's seen in some of the um, packages that have been put together in the US uh, and in Europe and in other countries to also invest in the technologies that we know that we're going to need um, for a full decarbonization of the energy system. Um, um, you know, I'm thinking about things like a really advanced battery chemistries um, and, and the whole hydrogen value chain as well is an area of great uh, interest at the moment. So I think there's that feeling that we have a, an advantage today compared with the 70s in, in, in the alternatives that are readily available. And we also have the Paris Agreement and we have a, a, an international framework that encourages countries to make sustainable choices. Now you can argue about how effective that is, but it's there and it will, to, it will condition some of those choices because people still care about the future of, of, of this planet. So um, that's, uh, that's, I think, reasons to, to believe that, whereas in the 1970s, we, all, we also saw a big surge in, in new coal capacity, some of which is still operating now. Um, we may be able to avoid the surge in investment in polluting technologies this time around. Thank you. Thank you for that optimistic uh, uh, take. Uh, now over to uh, someone who's actually have to deal with these issues on the ground. Uh, Minister Imbert, as Minister of Finance of an oil exporting economy, what policy priorities have these uh, recent uh, energy uh, price, uh, energy market volatilities generated for you? So we were actually in a strange position because we are an oil producer and a gas producer. But whenever the price of oil goes up, which is what has happened in the last 12 months or so, the price of fuel goes up, price of gasoline, price of diesel, and so on, goes up. And we find ourselves, because we have a history of subsidizing the price of fuel in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, it's interesting, this all goes back to the 1970s when they had the Yom Kippur war. Prior to that war, I think the price of oil was maybe $3 a barrel. And then it quickly escalated from $3 to $12, just in, you know, in a short period of time. The then government was of the view that it was unnecessary hardship on the population for them to pay the world market price of motor fuels at that time. So legislation was, was enacted creating a regime of fixed prices, fixed by the government, and also a petroleum price subsidy fund. So we, we've had these two regimes in place for the last um, 50 years. So we have a fund, which is a tax on oil companies, which is used to subsidize gasoline and diesel prices. And we also have a fixed price regime. We had hoped to be able to liberalize our fuel price regime in 2022. In fact, I announced it in last year's budget. And then <laughs> came Ukraine. So I was, I was looking at a, a, a oil price of maybe $65 a barrel at the time we had our budget. And then it quickly escalated to 100, 120 and so on. That, what, has, what that has done for us, because we are a huge consumer per capita of fuel. I think we probably have the largest number of cars per capita, the, the greatest number of cars per capita in the world. <laughs> so we have a population of 1.4 million and we have about, <laughs> over 1 million cars, believe it or not. <laughs> so, so that, we consume uh, a billion liters of fuel every year. So mm -hmm. one million population consuming a billion liters of fuel every year. Work that out, do the maths. That's <laughs> a thousand liters per person per year. So our fuel subsidy grew from virtually nothing in 2020-21 when prices were you know, 60 and below to the equivalent of 600 million US dollars. In, in the current year, we did not cater for that. We cannot deal with that. So we've had to increase prices. And I've been talking as Minister of Finance, signaling that I may have to increase prices again. I can't liberalize the market because it's crazy. So 
we have just been slowly, gradually increasing. So as an oil exporting economy, that's the problem you face. You, you get more revenue from higher prices. And if you're a subsidizer of fuel, which is what most oil exporting countries are, and I think Venezuela is probably the, the most ridiculous, if I could use that word. I mean, we're very friendly with Venezuela, so don't take that the wrong way in terms of subsidy, but you get more revenue and then you have to spend more to subsidize fuel. So we're trying to get out of that. In terms of moving away from carbon, we have started the process of, of uh, renewables. We have two very large solar electricity plants that are on their way, should hopefully uh, be able to take up maybe 20% of our electricity production in, in the near future. But the problem is, if we move to renewables, then we lose the revenue from selling oil and gas. So we have a real problem. I, if you speak to me personally, I'm very uh, interested in climate change. I've looked around the world, I've looked at the changes in weather, I've looked at you know, animals becoming extinct, I heard about some rhinoceros the other day becoming extinct. And therefore that's a real problem. I'm worried about that. But we can't move away from the production of oil and gas because that's the mainstay of our economy. So to put it in a nutshell, these are the problems that oil exporting economies face. Oil and gas is the core of our revenue base. We subsidize fuel, so we, we get it in one hand, and we have to give it away in the other hand. And then we, we want to go towards uh, clean energy, towards uh, helping the climate change problem. But if we do that, we shoot ourselves in the foot because we'll give up our main revenue source. So, I mean, I could talk a lot, but I just thought I would raise these core issues for this discussion. Yes, thank you, Minister. Uh, certainly uh, core issues. And I think everybody uh, agrees that uh, while there, there is limited compared to the 70s opportunity for substitution this time round, uh, there is uh, an opportunity to, to go to, to renewables. Uh, and on the demand side, uh, how do we uh, switch the demand, uh, reduce the demand? Uh, it, part of it is energy efficiency, but I do think uh, prices, right? Uh, and this is where the role of subsidies uh, and by the way, advanced countries are also introducing subsidies uh, to limit the price increases. I, I think this is going to be a big issue. And uh, as somebody who come, who come, I'm from Indonesia, we are, we are also, we were an oil exporting country back in the 70s. So one of the issues is really uh, how is, uh, is this an opportunity actually for a country, for the oil exporting countries uh, to move away from, uh, you know, on the one hand, you get the windfall, but uh, and then you give it away uh, with the subsidy. Is this not a time to address uh, the issue? Because the windfall goes away, which is what we always find, right? Maybe it's elevated for the next few years, but then it's going to come down and you are going to have to face uh, fiscal uh, constraint again. So uh, is it a time to actually address the subsidy? Phase it, how do you phase it out in a managed way? And uh, pivoted towards uh, more targeted uh, protection for your uh, vulnerable groups and diversify your economy. Uh, use the use the the um, uh, windfall uh, to begin that to diversify your economy, including going to renewables, which hopefully will help you uh, be less dependent on oil and gas revenue. I'm I'm just reflecting uh, that that you may be already very aware of this, uh, but how do you actually uh, do it? I think uh, we we should we should have further discussion on that. But let me now um, uh, uh, turn to uh, the next uh, set of uh, questions. Um, uh, price, energy price spikes create a wide right, range of policy challenges. We just heard uh, Minister mention them, uh, but this includes increasing inflation. And the energy price run up over the past two years has been a key factor that is driving global inflation to a 14 year high. So uh, Tim, to what extent have price pressures been dampened by subsidies and price controls? You know, we've just had this discussion, so it'd be good to, to go a little bit deeper into this. Well, that was a very rich exchange between two 
country representatives that have uh, first-hand experience of all of this. Um, and I, I, I have relatively little to add to, the, to that excellent picture that's been drawn already. Um, just to put a couple of numbers on this, I mean, we track subsidies um, and together with the OECD, um, we come up with a number for a sort of global fossil fuel subsidy bill. Um, you know, we had the commitment made in Glasgow to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, um, but in our view, um, in 2021, they doubled. And they doubled for all the reasons what we've heard, um, because as prices rise, so the gap between the regulated price and the, and the global market price uh, increases. Um, and as you said, Murray, the, um, over the last six months, we've had really a, an awful lot of additional um, measures being put in place to protect consumers from these exceptionally high, particularly gas and electricity prices. Uh, that we've seen around the world. So in, in 2021, um, our estimate of global fossil fuel subsidies was around 600 uh, billion US dollars. But since November last year, uh, we've had an extra $550 billion worth of interventions being made by governments uh, to, uh, to, to shield consumers from those prices. Now, from a consumer perspective, you know, some of those are welcome. I'm a, a UK national living in France. I'm not facing the same um, pressures on my electricity bill and my gas bill uh, that um, uh, that friends and colleagues in the in the UK are, but I'm also not facing the same incentives to to you know insulate better, to change my to buy a heat pump and to do all the things that could structurally change my energy consumption um, in in the future. And I think we need to recognise that prices on their own are a very blunt instrument to affect change. And you need that combination of an economic incentive and a supportive policy framework. Yeah. Um, and so there is an awful lot that policymakers can do to help consumers shield but protect themselves uh, from some of these risks. Um, I'm, I'm struck by not just the numbers for energy poverty, but for the number of households that feel they are not in a position to change their energy circumstances. Um, they don't have the, the wherewithal, the financing, the ability to access the technologies that they need. And I think that that is a very, very strong role there for governments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Let me uh, turn to Minister. In practice, uh, how can fiscal and monetary policy uh, in, in developing countries respond to the inflation uh, pressures created by rising energy prices? One of the things we have done which has made us very unpopular with the IMF, is we have refused to devalue our currency. So, so we were under tremendous pressure as a new government coming in seven years ago to devalue our currency and have a floating exchange rate. But we felt that that would have such an adverse inflationary effect that it wasn't a good idea. So we have kept our exchange rate more or less fixed for the last, um, seven years, and that has allowed us to keep inflation down to very low levels. In fact, we got inflation down to less than 1% before COVID came and attacked all of us. Even at this time now, we um, are only experiencing inflation of about 5%, which is half what the developed countries are experiencing. What I noticed, and I, it's, it's not just the exchange rate. Of course, subsidizing fuel is uh, another measure of keeping inflation down. And if I speak as a politician now, I notice that um, in the United States, you know, the, the uh, Democrats are facing a lot of difficulty in their midterms because of inflation. And they are coming up with all sorts of strategies try, to try and get the price of fuel down as being one of the main drivers. So what we are doing at our end, and I mean, we may be a little unique, we are not suffering from what I would call excessive inflation. We are not suffering from um, severe recession. One of the fortunate features of Trinidad and Tobago is that we established a sovereign wealth fund. We call it a heritage and stabilization fund. So in times when, in times of plenty, let's put it that way, we, is, we were able to make deposits to our sovereign wealth fund. And 
it reached as high as six billion US dollars just before COVID hit. And we were actually able to use that fund. We had significant drawdowns from that fund to keep our economy moving along. So that I'm not sure we are a good example because we had the sovereign wealth fund to dip into. We didn't devalue our currency. And the result of our, our policies, which is to try to maintain economic momentum, was that we've been able, the economy was able to withstand COVID and recover. I am not sure the contractionary fiscal policy being pursued by the Federal Reserve in the United States is the best approach to their problem. Now, of course, they're, they're all far more qualified than I am, but I, I don't think it's a good idea to try and tip you know, that, that economy into recession by increasing interest rates the way the um, Federal, Federal Reserve is trying to do it. I've looked at the equity markets, they're in shambles, you know, just a couple of days ago, the Dow fell by you know, over a thousand points. So if I am to answer your question, if I'm to summarize how I answer your question, try and not increase interest rates, try and maintain as many subsidies as you can, but also try and maintain government expenditure at reasonable levels in order to maintain economic momentum. That's my answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, but you know, we will have to pick up this subsidy discussion again. Well, I'm just saying uh, we, we may be a yeah, unique sure. country. Understood. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, now turn to Christiane because uh, you might want to uh, also respond uh, on those policy uh, discussion. And uh, really, uh, what has been the role of energy price surge in, the, in, uh, in inflation in the US and the Euro area? Sure. Well, uh, let me also uh, put some, uh, some numbers on that. So uh, uh, let's remember that after the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, oil prices have been on an upward trajectory, recovering steadily from uh, $40 a barrel uh, in October 2021. Uh, to about $84 a barrel in October 2022. And much of that increase was actually due to the strong recovery of, uh, of demand. Now, over the same time period, annual uh, CPI inflation in the US rose from 1.1% to 6.2%. Now, what you can do and what I do in my research is to use a structural model of uh, the global oil market augmented with measures of inflation uh, in order to uh, get a sense of how much of that uh, 5.1 percentage point increase uh, in inflation can be attributed to oil shocks. And it turned out to be uh, almost half. So uh, of those five percentage points, two percentage points uh, were coming from um, oil uh, price increases. Now, if we look at the period since the invasion of Ukraine, then annual, uh, annual um, CPI inflation increased uh, by another 1.1 percentage points, of which more than half um, was due to um, oil shocks. And uh, actually a, a very similar picture in terms of the contribution arises also for uh, the Euro area. Now it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about headline inflation here. So, uh, so this substantial contribution of energy prices goes beyond the direct effects um, that can be, um, uh, that's due to the energy component in the CPI itself, but there are other uh, indirect uh, effects that are at play. So firms passing on the higher production costs to uh, uh, the final consumers, uh, there's a possibility for second round effects like uh, um, increase uh, uh, wages, uh, um, uh, upward pressures and in inflation expectations. And I think the letters of a particular concern and uh, uh, they are actually uh, uh, will disagree with uh, what the minister just said. So I think given the high visibility of energy costs, um, they have a strong influence on inflation expectations. So there's a really great risk uh, that households and businesses expectations of future price increases become entrenched. And that is why it's so important that central banks around the world, in my view, uh, aggressively fight inflation so that they're basically continuing the path that they're on. They're raising interest rates, they're setting a clear signal um, that uh, they are willing uh, to bring inflation down in order to keep inflation expectations up. Thank you. That's a good segue to Natasha. Do you think central banks have responded appropriately? 
Um, the, the answer is yes, because I'm approaching this question as a commodities analyst and what we are dealing with, and especially in the second quarter of the year, when uh, you remember in June prices were breaking $130 per barrel and supply chains were creaking. It was visible. There was not enough supply and demand was extremely strong. But at the same time, uh, every government, including five states in the United States, came and said that, that there will be subsidies. So what we were dealing with is that very little supply, but at the same time, demand was subsidized. And then what we needed, we needed less demand. So to 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 balance supply and demand. So from that perspective, uh, Chairman Powell acknowledged that in the Jackson Hole, at the central banks, they have been waiting for supply to adjust after the pandemic, but it did not. So because of that, they had to step in and to bring demand lower to uh, to pretty much meet supply at some point. So since June, developed market central banks have been very aggressive uh, in tightening. So the, some of the numbers are showing that this was the fastest pace of tightening in a three months window since 1980s. And uh, the Fed is acknowledging that it will need to become uh, restricted for some time. Uh, so just to put some numbers out there in terms of our forecasts, our economists are looking for policy rates to approach 4% uh, in the US, UK and Canada, 3% in Australia, New Zealand, and 2% in the Euro area by mid 2023. Um, so similarly, uh, there has been a significant response in fiscal policy in terms of uh, lowering impact on households income. So the most recent example was uh, in a new stimulus announced in the UK and the euro area. And overall, the numbers we're looking in terms of uh, subsidies, uh, energy subsidies, explicit and implicit for this year, we believe that they will likely average more than $7 trillion. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, for, uh, Natasha. We have uh, 10 minutes left uh, to the session, so I'm going to take the questions from the audience, uh, and I will pose one question to three of you and uh, the last question to, to Natasha. So to Tim, uh, Minister Imbert, and Christian, the question from the audience is, many developing countries are not major contributors to global emissions and have limited financing options. How should these countries engage in the energy transition? So uh, please be brief because we have 10 minutes left. So, uh, Tim? I think um, there are huge opportunities there. I, 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 I don't accept the idea that, um, that energy transitions are somehow a luxury item. Um, we're talking about technologies that are not just clean, but they are the most affordable right now for electricity generation. Um, so there is a strong economic incentive to bring them in at scale to markets. Uh, there's a strong energy security imperative uh, to do so. And naturally, there's a strong environmental reason to do so as well. But we are very concerned that if you look at all of the emerging and developing economies and you exclude for the purposes of this uh, uh, number, the uh, experience in China, um, the amount of money going into clean energy investment is basically where it was in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed. Now, of course, technology costs have come down, so the same amount of money today um, gets, you, gets you more gigawatts of capacity. But that number is a long way from where it would need to be in order to meet rising demand for energy services in a sustainable way. So there's a huge amount for us to do, and we've worked closely together with the World Bank and others on, on thinking through the measures that can 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 encourage that those capital flows uh, to to developing and, and, and emerging economies. Thanks. Uh, a lot of it uh, rests on policy, uh, obviously. Uh, so, Minister uh, Imbert, any comment on that question? It seems I'm I'm going to be the odd person out in this conversation. <laughs> Just to make a point that I'm not a fan of uh, increasing interest rates because that's recessionary in my opinion. But that's beside the point. You know, uh, years ago, I was, I was doing some research into um, policy with respect to uh, revenue collection, revenue generation from oil and gas. And I discovered that some of the countries that um, push the hardest, push the developing world the hardest in terms of moving out of fossil fuel consumption and fossil fuel production and into clean energy, some of them are the largest consumers of the most polluting sources of energy, for example, coal. So if you look in the EU, you have Germany, you have Poland, 
And you have so many other countries who are relying on coal and in fact are increasing their coal production. And you have to ask yourself why? Because if you, the whole world is moving towards uh, dealing with climate change and moving towards clean, green sources of energy, if that's the whole world is speaking with one voice and saying we must deal with climate change, we must move away from fossil fuel utilization. Why are developed economies and even other economies moving back to a coal consumption? And the reason is price. Coal is the least expensive form of energy. So that in this discussion, one has to take into account the economic effects of the ideal of moving away from fossil fuel utilization and into solar, wind, wave, whatever kind of energy, renewable energy that um, you want to use. So that to deal with the question, I would urge any developing country that is not an oil producer to try and move to renewables as quickly as possible because the price of oil and gas is so unpredictable that we may see what this entire panel has predicted that oil will remain at $95, $100 and so on. But it's not just oil, it's gas. I remember in 2016, 2017, the price of natural gas, the Henry Hub price dropped below $2 for MMBTU. It's now eight or $9. And that's not reflective of the world situation. Even though Henry Hub is $9, Henry Hub is probably an anachronism now, like Lake Charles has become. Because in Europe, the natural gas is $25, $30. In Japan, it's $50. So that when developing countries have to deal with that, and they will have to convert to their electricity generation plants away from fuel oil and other heavy oil um, forms of fuel to natural gas. They have to. They have no choice as they move towards solar. So I would urge every... Um, developing country that is not a producer of oil and gas to move swiftly to renewable energy production, mainly because that will insulate them from the shocks that I do see coming in the price of oil and natural gas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, Christian? Uh, well, my take uh, on this might be complementary to what the Minister just said. So. Uh, um, and it is that, uh, well, to the extent uh, that uh, these developing countries are producers of raw materials that form the backbone of the energy transition, so uh, uh, take all the base metals, uh, copper, lithium, cobalt, nickel, uh, whatever, I mean, uh, uh, they can contribute to the energy transition by ramping up uh, the production because uh, we're in dire need of increasing um, uh, a production to, uh, to meet uh, the ever-growing demand uh, for these kind of inputs to, uh, to foster the energy transition and uh, that would also benefit uh, their economies. And if it's a matter of, uh, 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 of limited financing options, so if they need financing, and I guess that goes back to, to Tim, I mean, increase FDI, bring uh, uh, investors uh, uh, from abroad in. Thank you. I'm going to pose uh, one more a question from the audience, and I'll, I would like Natasha to uh, answer the question. What is the role of OPEC in uh, helping to reduce high energy prices? Will the production of renewable energy, which is not concentrated in a small number of countries, result in lower energy uh, price volatility? Um, so I'll start with the second question. Uh, no, we, we don't see that taking place at least over the next decade. Uh, so just to put this, some number there in terms of what we're looking is that we do believe that the energy complex will remain short of energy uh, between now and 2030. So we, we have a significant gap that needs to be bridged and in terms of financing, what needs to be invested to bridge that gap. But again, we're very agnostic what type of energy we're talking, the, whether it's uh, fossil fuels or it's a renewable energy, but the gap is about $1.3 trillion cumulative between now and 2030 that 
that needs to be put into the markets to, to get supply to match demand of energy, as being agnostic to what type of energy we're discussing. Uh, in the case of OPEC, uh, as uh, Christian already covered that, uh, and Tim alluded to that as well, is that they are at capacity. So to some extent, uh, I believe that capacity is a little bit of an artificial number there. And because of that, the number that is being quoted, that they're 3.6 million barrels per day below their quarters, it's uh, uh, it, the, the quarter is too high. So because of that, in general, I don't like quoting that number. But overall, what we're observing is that the majority of countries outside of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, United Arab Emirates and Kuwait, those four countries out of the whole complex is that uh, the rest cannot increase their production. They're trying, the prices are there, the incentives are there, everything is there, they should be producing as much as they can and they can't. Uh, so those years of underinvestment are now clearly visible. So from that perspective, there's not that much they can do, especially if 2023 turns out to be a healthy good year, recession averted, global growth is humming, China is back, uh, COVID is out. Uh, so then no, yes, we, we look at higher prices. Thank you. Uh, I think we've come to, unfortunately come to the end of this very uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, perhaps just in one minute summarize a little bit uh, some of the main uh, messages that came out. I think we all agree that uh, energy prices are going to be remaining elevated uh, for the foreseeable future with a lot of uncertainties, but that technology uh, can also play a role. And I think Tim, uh, you were on the more optimistic side that there are actually also opportunities uh, that we will see uh, for maybe more renewable energy uh, production as well as the role of technology in, in, in other aspects. There was a big difference between the 1970s, both on the supply side uh, with less substitution possibilities, but at the same time opportunity uh, to have a renewable energy uh, increase in production uh, and less uh, potential compared to the 70s to affect the demand side. But we could, we should still, of course, uh, look at the efficiency, energy efficiency use, as well as, uh, you know, relative price um, signaling. And this all falls uh, on, on the, the way governments need to frame their policies and provide the right incentives for the, the right uh, changes uh, to happen. Uh, but a point taken uh, with Minister Imberts, uh, you are in the hot seat, you have to deal with these uh, policy choices uh, that uh, I think we need to see how you can actually uh, manage that process, the transition uh, from, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the uh, issues at hand uh, with, the, with the population that uh, is still expecting low prices and how do you phase it out and repurpose those uh, revenues uh, still uh, with the uh, population in, in mind and phasing it out in a, in a, in a managed transition. So, um, and, and I, I think the final point, which uh, some of you have emphasized is the importance of, uh, of, of this situation as an opportunity for a diversification uh, uh, for uh, renewable energy and uh, a decarbonization path. So and the answer to energy security uh, is diversification uh, and continuation of the decarbonization, including uh, on the energy uh, efficiency side. So um, let me stop there with a big thank you to Christian, Minister Imbert, Natasha, and Tim, and Tim, uh, to and to everyone that uh, tuned in. Please share this conversation with your colleagues, friends, and followers on social media. And thank you so much again uh, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Well, that's it for this special program on World Bank Live. We hope you've enjoyed today's program and found some of this insightful. If you want to take a deep dive into some of the issues we've discussed today, check out the latest edition of the Global Economic Prospects, which you can find at worldbank.org forward slash GEP. And coming next month, a new edition of the Commodities Market Outlook. You can find that at worldbank.org forward slash commodities. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, goodbye. Mm -hmm.